Geordie. Hello and welcome to the Big Travel Podcast. I'm Lisa Francesca Nand. Now, how's your experience on Instagram been? If you are indeed on Instagram, I am on Instagram. I'm Lisa Francesca underscore Nand and also the Big Travel Podcast. And well, I don't know. I mean, I enjoy it. I love uh, seeing other people's pictures. I love following the travel accounts, but I don't know if I'm very good at it. I've only got a comparatively small 2,000 or so followers on my main account. And I'm, I'm much bigger on Twitter, where I am at LF Nand. And I enjoy chatting on Twitter because I get to, I don't find it like a nasty place. You know, some people say it's a nasty place, um, maybe because I don't sort of say anything controversial anymore. The days when I used to wade into political debates have gone, uh, mainly because I just find it really exhausting and depressing and actually didn't really change anything. Anyway, I digress. I wanted to speak about Instagram because the person I've got on today's show is somebody I've followed from my very early days on Instagram. And I remember thinking, how on earth am I going to break into this field and that everyone's doing it and everyone's so much more successful at it than me and you know what nothing changed has changed particularly I haven't got much more success but the person I'm speaking to today has always been a bit of an inspiration and we got chatting on Twitter and I, she just feels like a friend already we decided that we needed to have each other on each other's podcast now she's got a brilliant podcast called Hashtag Authentic and she speaks to creative people about their work and indeed their lives and of course I had to have her back on the big travel podcast because she's got a fantastic story. One, she's just bought a house in France which is a long-held dream of hers but also she is a traveller that needs special assistance and when she travels through airports especially she has to have a wheelchair because she has a long-term chronic and debilitating illness which really affects her energy levels. Anyway, she's an absolute inspiration and I'm so excited to have Sarah Tasker, aka me and Orla, as she is on Instagram, but she's much more than an Instagram expert. She's also a coach and a photographer and I'm so chuffed to have her here on the podcast. Sarah Tasker spent lockdown obsessing about the perfect French house, which she has now bought. And if you follow her on Instagram, you know she's an expert in making things look beautiful. On this episode, we talk French bakeries, river beaches, Insta retreats, West Yorkshire, the challenges faced by travelling with a disability, getting left on a plane due to her wheelchair, growing up with parents that didn't have passports, childhood holidays to Blackpool Pontins, our mutual embarrassment of second home problems, and so much more. Sarah Tasker is on the Big Travel Podcast. So I am sat in our French house. It's a very old farmhouse and it's in a kind of slight state of dilapidation. I'm sat on the bed, but the bed is in the living room because the bedrooms are not bedrooms yet. And the windows are open. It is like 25 degrees here today very sunny but slowly turning to autumn so I have the doors open and we keep getting a gust of wind and it blows in lots of dried leaves but it's warm and the birds are singing and the bees are buzzing and it feels like the most peaceful place on earth that sounds incredible what are you wearing I feel a bit seedy now <laughs> what color underwear uh, have you got Chanel on? number five and a smile <laughs> <laughs> I'm wearing a nap dress from yeah, Hill good. House which I very intentionally bought so like a white floaty dress that I very intentionally bought to wear at my French house it was very like part of the vision for me was always floating around in white linen dresses in yeah meadows. absolutely yeah until you like spill your coffee or one of your kids like the red her. wine yeah. yeah the red wine yeah <laughs> hazardous especially in France um <laughs> I have you been are you floating around in your white nap dress because you just look like that you know you look wonderful daily or are you actually doing some do, do are you actually doing some no. photographs this morning no I actually just wear this but it's basically a nighty so it's a nighty you can wear in the daytime so it's you know it's got all the comfort of staying in bed I want to be you it just sounds and look fantastic <laughs> and I I'm guessing like somewhere in the back of the beautiful beautifully curated Instagram photos I'm guessing there's a pile of washing somewhere right oh my goodness yeah we well when we got here this time so the, we've only been here twice this is the second time and 
it was better than the first time, but there was still like some mouse poo in the sandals I left here and <laughs> like bats in one of the bedrooms that we had to chase out with a broom. And it's it's not all completely picturesque and idyllic, like some horrible stuff had come down one of the chimneys, but it's part of the adventure, right? And how did you how did you find it? Like, how did you find that place? I know that for a long time you were looking for your perfect French house. And I anyone was. who's seen your posts online will know that you found like the most stunning, the quintessential French property, I would say. How did you find it? How did it come about? I was just obsessing. So I was looking online all through lockdown. It really, the idea just consumed me in lockdown that I needed to escape I think a lot of us had that feeling and it manifested in different ways and we were really fortunate that we could afford to buy somewhere in France certainly not in the UK but in France Mm. especially in the countryside with a lot of very affordable old property so I was just trawling I must have looked at literally like a million properties in the sense that I would probably look at over 100 200 a day for several years and there was one that was the dream and it got away like it, it we were going to see it do you remember in lockdown when you couldn't get passports renewed and you couldn't travel at mm-hmm. all and so we were waiting and waiting to come over to see this house that I'd just fallen in love with online and it'd been on the market for four years two days before we were due to view it someone bought it so it was properly the one that got away it broke my heart I literally I had to go to bed and sob because I just <laughs> romanticized me in this house to that extent and then after that, nothing really lived up to it, like the one that got away, like like the dream boyfriend that never had a chance to really annoy you. So I'm sure your husband doesn't mind that at all. But, uh... <laughs> like the celebrity crush, let's say, like the yeah, celebrity exactly. crush, yeah, yeah. who never, you know, never leaves wet towels on the bed and always in your imagination can just do everything right. And it that was what it was with the house. So we kept looking at houses and looking at houses. And of course, it's so expensive. Like every time you want to see one, we had to come over we've got a nine-year-old so she was coming with us we've got many pets so they all had to be looked after we'd come we'd look at houses they weren't right we'd go back and so eventually I thought I think I just have to stop waiting for the right house and just make a house the right one so I picked one I was like I'm going to pick one that we'd see on this trip this is the one right let's buy it let's do it and it's so far it's, it's working out so the dream, the dream house that got away, it's sort of, it's almost like love the one you were, if you can't be, I'm gonna, not going to yeah. sing to you with the one you love, <laughs> love the one you're with. I think, you know, where does, where do those feelings come from? It's really not so much about the bricks and the wood and the glass, but about the stories we tell ourselves about the places or the people or the houses and the things. And I was telling myself beautiful stories about that first house and then not taking the time to do that about the other houses we were seeing. So my kind of job here is to constantly tell myself stories that make me fall in love with this house more and more and it it, it so far it seems to be working does the house itself have a story do you know how old it was or who had it yeah we do know a few bits and pieces so I think originally it was um, a working farmhouse it's surrounded by lots of fields and it owns quite a lot of the fields and it's a two-story but upstairs has never been touched so even though it's ceiling height like you can walk around up there it's got full height doorways it was only ever used for storage I guess like for grain or whatever they had up there um but the family that owned it before us have had it for a really really long time passing it on from generation to generation and the woman who lived here until it was sold is kind of she's got a real reputation all the neighbors kind of make an interesting face when they talk about her and I think she was kind of a bit of a a bit of a a bit of a force maybe a bit of a battle axe um for example so the house comes with all of these little parcels of land some of them are tiny and you know it's like a little bit of a woodland and a little bit of a meadow and our nearest neighbors are a lesbian couple and in their garden they have um this little patch of land that's ours like it's (laughs) maybe enough to put like a patio table and chairs and the woman who owned this house refused to sell it to them she just wanted to keep that tiny piece of land and they made our offers and everything so they were really frightened when we showed up about who we were going to be and what was going to happen to their garden with this piece of land I was like yeah we're going to make that the party garden we're just going (laughs) to put a sound system and a really small pool in there (laughs) that's the nudist area (laughs) yeah I think we're just going to give it happen why would that happen how how does that happen I guess you don't know well someone explained it to me the estate agent said what what it will have been is 
the land was originally owned by you know so many families and then every time someone died they would divide the land up between their children so one piece of land becomes four pieces of land and then those children grow up and die and leave it to their children so the four pieces of land become 12 pieces of land and on and on and on until all the pieces of land are quite small and insignificant but they're all owned by such wildly different people and no one really knows who anyone is and who owns it so what's lovely is it means it's never going to be touched it can't be developed it can't be you know nothing can happen to it because nobody owns enough of it to do anything to it the the French and their land and countryside it's very complicated and I forget I need to listen back to one of my previous 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 episodes um somebody explained it to me about how they get handed down in families and then there's a big tax and then nobody wants them and that's how we're able to snap up French properties that are actually not really wanted like we want you know people don't want to like go through the hassle of it yeah apparently the the Basilex woman who owns the house she has children but they didn't want anything to do with the house so that's how it ended up being Amazing. for sale. This isn't this is the second time you've done this isn't it because you you moved from Manchester to where you actually live now in West Yorkshire which is a, a, a move from the city to a, a, quite a rural looking place by the look yeah. of it. Yeah yeah and, and that at the time felt like the hugest leap like that felt like a once in a lifetime leap and then, of course, you kind of normalise it. And after a while living there, it didn't feel rural enough anymore. And it just felt like real life again. So I think that I think that was like the baby step that made this feel less frightening, this idea of let's just buy something in the middle of nowhere in France when we don't speak any French yet. And, and what, what's next? You're going to end up in like a, you know, gone from rural to rural France. You're going to end up in some <laughs> huts on the mountainside. And, to bear, yeah, but I don't know. What, rope. How do you get more rural? You're, yeah, or like one of those remote Hebridean islands where they just need one family. That yeah, could be you should do, yeah, but who, <laughs> no, weather, no way. No way, no, you made, the, no. You made the right choice. So what does, <laughs> I know it's only your second visit there, but what does daily life look like there? Describe a lovely day to me. It definitely involves going to a French supermarket. That's not worn off yet, the excitement of French supermarkets for me. Everything's so much better. Like the fruit and vegetable selection's incredible. The wine is like five aisles of selections. Um, yeah, I just I just love the newness of it. Um, normally first thing in the morning we go to the bakery one of us me or my husband will go out to the nearest bakery in the village because if you don't get there before 9am you don't get anything like everything's sold out and so then he'll come back and make coffee and we'll get up slowly and then Uh, At the moment, it's a lot of DIY or driving to places to collect like secondhand furniture or paint, those kind of things, and then coming back and wrestling with some of the really urgent jobs in the house. But they are, you know, for the most part, they're actually really nice jobs to do, like painting over old woodwork or uh, repainting tiles and things like that. We're just kind of on the cosmetic stage of fixing things up at the moment. And there is a lot more structural work that's going to need to be done, but we need to save up again because I spent all my money buying the house. So <laughs> that's going to be further down the line. And have you got any nice things nearby? Can you walk to a, like, a nice little village or a bistro or a cafe? Obviously the bakery. Yeah, so the nearest village hasn't got very much left in it anymore, but we've got the bakery. We've got lots of really nice walks in the woodland. Some of the woodland is owned by us, so it's even more magical. <laughs> and then, As one does, owns a bit and, of the woodland. Yeah, yeah. Just <laughs> walking through my woodland. And we have... Um, a big meadow that's like an orchard so even just going out there and picking your own fruit is a total adventure um and then one of my favorite things we found is there's a river beach so I think they've imported some additional sand to make it more beachy but in the summer months it's got like a really nice cafe kind of cafe bar and then just this huge expanse of sand on this gorgeous flowing river it's the river drawn and They've even got like, it's so well organized. So there's a roped off section for children. That's the safe bit for the young ones to paddle and swim in. And everyone's there like every day of the week. It's really full of people just enjoying it and swimming and making the most of it. We're only about an hour and a bit from the actual seaside, but that, that little beach is about 10 minutes away. So. Oh my God, it's just absolutely idyllic. It really is. It just sounds incredible. Are you planning to to use it for work as well? Like yeah. To invite yeah. People over? Yes, once I know it's safe enough and I'm not going to like electrocute anybody or have some <laughs> horrendous liability. Wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, there's so much potential, especially because it's it's a big house and it obviously when we get around to renovating upstairs, it can be even bigger. I would love to do even something like, you know, 
writing retreats here just for people who want to get something completed whether you're writing your book or you're writing a class or a course or whatever it is I've gone on those retreats and the power of being in a, a room with other people who are focused on their project and having dedicated time every day. But then in the evenings, you know, you just go and sit in the field and drink wine and swing in a hammock and eat bread and cheese. I think it could be really fun. Oh, it sounds lovely. And, and that even sitting in a field, you know, sitting in a, in a field here at the moment, drinking wine, like something's gone terribly wrong with your life. Um, <laughs> when, yeah. And it's like November. And, um, <laughs> you know, but actually the, you can see that how sitting in a field in France drinking wine is actually, you know, a really, a really totally good Totally acceptable. Yeah, totally yeah. acceptable. Here. I think I felt like uh, about 12 o'clock in, uh, today at around lunchtime, I think I could have done with going and sitting in a field and drinking <laughs> because <laughs> I was the crazy lady shouting at the checkout you know those electronic checkouts uh the the self-service things I ended up unexpected item in the bagging was, area exactly I ended up <laughs> shouting at it because it wouldn't and everyone turned around to look and I'm like oh my god that person and I swore and I've got my 10 year old with me I was a swearing crying mother at the till so yeah no I would totally drink wine in any field right now or really- <laughs> just, just a bit of wasteland on the side of the road just pull over and get out with the yeah, wine basically <laughs> I actually um I, I did speak to my 10 year old who is, is off school um but uh and I, he said who are you interviewing and I showed him your your Instagram um following because you were one of the first people I ever followed I, I sort of signed up to Instagram and then didn't really do much to it and my friend yeah. um Christy, who's actually, she's got a good following. She, her name is Mama Prada. Hello, Christy, oh, yes. listening. And she recommended you. So I did. So you're the one, of, one of the first people I followed. And I just think you've done, you know, incredibly well. And it's inspirational. But my 10-year-old, I'm going to bring you down here. My 10-year-old <laughs> yeah. said, she, he said, oh, how many followers she's, has she got? And I said, 220,000. He was like, well, it's not a million, is it? I was like, oh, <laughs> great, Sam. And it's because they're looking it's at, like, he's, you know, he he watches Mr. Beast and like these YouTubers who've yeah. got like, you know, sort of 60 million followers or something. It's um, a different world. And even if you look world. at like the numbers on TikTok and things now, like they weren't even possible in, in the heyday of Instagram. It's the video and kind of that celebrity celebrity content creator thing is is a whole different world so I'm not particularly up for engaging with if I'm really honest well you don't need to do you you know yeah. you've got your own um you know it's gone it's gone tremendously well for you how did what was that what was the path to uh you know to to doing it it was kind of one of those overnight successes that actually had been years and years of doing really similar things and working my way towards it so I'd always blogged and I'd been like an amateur photographer and I'd been always very nerdy about the internet I always had like a forum that was running or I'd you know uh, there was a website called Chictopia which was like a daily fashion sharing website and I, I got some sort of award on there and I was always like trying to trying to kind of establish some sort of platform for myself I suppose and then I went on maternity leave had my daughter so this is nine years ago and she just wanted to sleep on me and so I was trapped on the sofa for many many hours a day looking for some sort of creative outlet and found Instagram so there were a lot of people then just it was those really early days where you just shared a genuine picture of your life like if you had some nice coffee you would take a picture and post it there and then and I decided to do a photo a day for a year because that first year of your first child's life it felt so momentous Mm -hmm. everything felt momentous So I was capturing those things and putting them up. And I thought, oh, I wonder if I can get a thousand followers in a year. And that was in the January. And then by the April, I was at something like 35,000. And it just kept going. It wants, it seems to, I read, God, I can't even speak. Uh, I'm in the wrong job. Um, (laughs) I get paid to speak, like very occasionally get paid to speak. Uh, Otherwise I just speak. Uh, Right. Get a grip, please, sir. Uh, It seems to, it seems to have gone really well, really quickly. Did you have a plan? Because you went from posting about you and Orla to like now, you know, Instagram has become the, the job rather than, yeah. Oh, you know what I'm talking about. I totally know what you're talking about. I know it was somebody does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't have a clear path. I remember, so I worked in the NHS at the time when I went back after maternity leave. I went back to speech therapy, and I remember on my lunch breaks, I would pitch to brands. This is like I don't even think the term influencer existed. I really don't think it was a thing then, and. 
I remember pitching one of the first brands I pitched to was Bowdoin. And I was like, do you want to give me free clothes to show to my followers in exchange for me telling everyone how awesome you are? And it felt like the cheekiest ask. I felt like, you know, like I'd basically just said, do you want to give me a million pounds? And they said, yeah, they said, we love a woman with boxy. Go on then and sent me some stuff. And that was kind of the beginning, like just figuring out how do I make the fact that this audience is here and they're interested in what I'm sharing and they're listening to what I say. How do I turn that into something that means I can be at home more with my daughter? I can live a slower life. I I have a health condition. And by that point, I was really struggling with full time work. So it was a lot of flailing around and trying things and failing at things and doing things and realizing they didn't align with my values. You know, there's a lot of when you're doing that kind of influencer work, I do love it. But if your only source of income is that you're very dependent on what offers land in your inbox and you kind of end up having to say yes to things that maybe you would prefer not to in an ideal world. So I was always looking for like, what other revenue streams can I put in here? And that's when I started with the coaching and mentoring and then that turned into teaching and then that turned into the podcast and the book and all of the different strands now. I mean, you, you talked about, you referred to your uh, your chronic illness and, yeah. you know, said that you you chose this path to in part like not be doing a a job you know not having to go to to work every day which I can absolutely relate to but it sounds like you're doing so much uh, you know in the end you are doing a job but is it (laughs) is it does it work out for you because you're doing it on your own terms yes it works a lot better I'm I'm certain that now as my health has deteriorated over the years I think if I was trying to work a conventional job I'd just be on benefits there's no way I could Mm. get up every day and sit in an office for eight and a half hours like I used to so the fact that I'm still a functional like human and you know contributing to society feels really really good and it's really kind of made my awareness of disability shift over these years and realizing that so much of what we call disabled is actually just not being able to slot into the machine as it currently works so I I can work and I can produce value I just can't do it in the way that a conventional job would expect me to um I always said my goal was to have a job that I could do from bed and I I do have that I can do anything I need to from my phone so I'm even in bed now right I'm sat on the bed in my nighty dress (laughs) I want photo evidence. I do. I will send um, you one as soon as Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. Uh, yeah, I mean, God, I, you know, I'm going to go around. I won't go down the rabbit hole, but it, it just makes me, me think about, you know, how many other people are having not just normal conditions, but, you know, speaking as a woman, like bad periods yes, or yes. thyroid conditions or menopause or, you know, everything. And you've just got to get up and do it, don't you? And it's just it's about it is about um you know being disabled in that way disabled by the the challenges that if you're in a wheelchair you're disabled by the the stairs that are there you know right just always... right it's not your body it's, it's the no. stairs that cause the problem exactly well anyway it's a total rabbit hole and we're here to, here to talk about um travel so we've done france we've done so what we could talk about is yeah tra- travel and disability you want I was, to I was abs- that was exactly where I was going yes <laughs> yeah so does it does it affect you I mean obviously you, you you know you do try and choose to work from bed where you can but has it affect your your getting around you're seeing the world yeah I mean it hasn't it hasn't because I still have been able to do it I'm very fortunate in that sense I'm fortunate that I have my husband with me most of the time he makes it much easier for me but it's very fresh in my mind I've just done the whole airport thing two days ago and it's so hard. Like, I think it's hard for everyone anyway. I'm, I'm not convinced that anyone enjoys the whole process of traipsing through an airport and security and everything. But when your body carries extra needs, it's so hard. So I, the only time I ever need to use a wheelchair is at an airport. We have to book special assistance for me. And it's that's so much to just do with the sheer distance that you're expected to cover you you know like so say Manchester airport which is one of my nearest airports the walk that you're expected to do between all the duty free and all of the shops and then all the way to the gates and there's quite often a degree of like standing on stairs to queue all of that is too difficult for me and if I try to do it what will tend to happen is I'll faint just faint away and, and end up walloping my head on something so we have to book special assistance not so long ago when there was all the queues happening in in the airport there was this article of something like the mail or something that was complaining about lots more people oh, asking for assistance so I was like well of course people if you're gonna go 
you know, to and think you might be waiting in a queue for two hours, if you might have a you know some sort of condition that you can walk through normally and it's okay this is uncomfortable and get on with it it's the difference between needing assistance and not needing assistance of course people are going to ask for assistance absolutely infirm or tired or unwell or got a bad leg or you know there's so many things that might need extra assistance and they're not always immediately obvious and you must have that as a young fit looking woman Um, right you must get that as well I'm guessing absolutely and it brings so much kind of shame and doubt up with you because what I hadn't realized until it happened to me is there's never a day when someone tells you you're disabled like the doctor doesn't sit you down and go right you've passed the level now Mm -hmm. you're allowed to use a wheelchair at the airport it's kind of up to you and I fought it for far too long because I don't know because I didn't think I needed it enough or because I was worried about what other people would think or you know, it's, I don't enjoy it. I feel very odd being pushed by someone else as a very independent person. I think a lot of people would relate to that. It doesn't feel comfortable at all. So that article, I remember it so clearly because it, it makes you feel like maybe you are a fraud. Maybe you should be suffering through it. And uh, yeah, it it's such a difficult thing. And, and I remember reading recently online from um, an ability blogger, she'd said, if you think that your life could benefit even just 10% from using some sort of mobility aid, then you probably should be using one and you'll probably get way more than 10% value from it. And that really struck me because that's exactly what it was with the wheelchair for me. You know, I put it off far too long. I probably should have been using it for longer than I have been. And even then, like, you know, it was only a flight from the UK to France. It was all very smooth. There were no delays but I've needed to rest for the the past two days to recover because my body has just been broken by the ordeal of travel. So I can imagine it really, really takes it out of you. Is I've forgotten what the condition is. I know it's long-term and chronic. Yeah. So it's called dysautonomia. Some people know it as POTS, which stands for postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. It just means that all of the kind of processes that your body does automatically go a bit haywire. And that can be things like blood pressure and heart rate and temperature control and digestion. And so for the fainting, for example, it just means that the longer I stand up, the more the blood gets stuck at the bottom of my body and doesn't come back up. So there's a certain point where there's just not enough in my brain. And so it, it, it flops me over to fix the problem. It just makes me pass out. You talked about um, so you, it having got got worse. Is it something that will, that will gradually continue to get worse? Uh, it's one of those things where it's very individual and we don't really understand it very much. Like a lot of women's health problems, it's kind of, you know, it's just a mystery that we've never really looked into very much. (laughs) So that isn't the case for everybody. Some people go into remission and, and do really well. But what we do know is similar to things like chronic fatigue syndrome, the harder you push yourself, the more likely you are to become more severe. And I did push myself for a really long time to keep working, to stay in my job, to stay, you know, active and independent and all of those things. Um, So I think I'd probably have worsened myself through those years of doing doing that in ignorance. I didn't have a diagnosis. I didn't know what I should be doing. It felt like the right thing. Um, So now a lot of my time is is spent resting and trying to combine rest with things that still feel joyful or interesting or nourishing and and a big part of the French house was that it was kind of me saying if I have to spend a lot of time at home where do I want home to be what do I want it to look like you know do you have visions of moving there yes I would I would move here in a heartbeat I would just do it but my daughter has friends and school and everything in the UK and my husband has family that he's very close to I have family too but I don't mind (laughs) I don't mind there being an ocean (laughs) between us that's fine um but yeah for Rory it's a bit more tricky so I think for now it's it's half and half but I do suspect as soon as it makes sense we'll be here full time so has it stopped you from traveling what is uh, what of the uh, what has the rest of your life like uh, previously been with travel have you, I, I think you went to Australia I saw on Pinterest yeah. or something random like that I, I went to Australia from an Instagram opportunity I was invited to speak at an event in Orange in Australia in New South Wales and so yes yeah, so we went to Sydney for a while then they paid for our travel it was amazing and the event was just gorgeous um I've been to Berlin with work and Dublin and Greece and Italy, Venice. Oh, Venice is my favourite place. Mm, um, 
but I hadn't I'd say I hadn't really traveled very much so my parents didn't even have passports until my sister got married in Spain and they had to get them so I'd never traveled anywhere outside of the UK even outside of England I don't think wow until... that's interesting you don't often yeah. come across people without passports these days well I certainly don't maybe it's no I don't why did they not have passports tell us about your parents uh I they just have no desire zero desire to travel zero desire to to change their status quo the their I think the things that they prize most in life are routine and their idea of normal and yet so my grandparents who lived two doors down they really really love to travel they you know were so excited about the affordability of flights that sort of kicked in in when was it kind of the 90s in the 50s oh right sorry but yeah oh, sorry yeah well kind of 50s almost but for them I suppose yeah budget like, airlines you know, absolutely budget, in the 90s, yeah. yeah um and so from then they were always traveling so in the end they took pity on me and my sister and got us passports and took us to uh, Mallorca when we were teenagers just to show us what a plane was like and I think they were very aware that you know if we didn't normalize travel at a young age it could become a bit like it was for our parents, like a big thing, a big barrier, the idea of going abroad. So I was, I'm really grateful for that. And they, I think my kind of sense of wanderlust definitely comes from them and their, they were, they went to really exciting places. They went to Egypt and they'd go to Croatia and they went to like Memphis and the Grand Canyon. They were always off on adventures. Well, I'm fascinated by your grandparents living two doors down from your parents and them going to all these exotic and quite adventurous places and your parents not even having passports. Yeah, yeah. That's At one point, really my grandparents offered, they offered to get them passports and pay for a holiday to Spain or somewhere for the for all of us. We're like a family of five. And my mum said she'd rather have fitted wardrobes so she took the money but got fitted <laughs> wardrobes instead <laughs> that's so funny it's what very my mum what were they doing for work your parents what was like like life like growing up uh so my dad was he worked for the council in environmental health he was like one of the men that goes and shuts down restaurants if they've got terrible right, yeah. cockroach problems or whatever mm-hmm. and my mum worked as a school nurse assistant um, and did some child minding and things just to try and make ends meet so yeah all of our childhood holidays were at Blackpool Pontins. Good we <laughs> um, actually went away not everyone can you know nope. afford to or do anything. Not at all yeah yeah and actually you know we loved them we loved yeah. that uh, but yeah so that was kind of We'd, we'd scrape through the year and then every couple of years we'd go away somewhere like that for a bit of a holiday. And that was all I knew really until until I was old enough to start traveling on my own. And, and I did have a lot of travel anxiety for a long time. Even now, if I don't travel for a while, you know, like after the pandemic, I think a lot of us had quite a big sense of trepidation about doing it all again. Um, but yeah, I, I can't I can't imagine not. I can't imagine having to having to live the way that they choose to live and just staying in Manchester suburb and never leaving. What pushed you over the edge? What pushed you out the country? So you had that first trip to Mallorca with your grandparents. Did it open your eyes to something? Yeah, I think everything, you know, like it's just when you, when you're away, it's that immersion in a different life and different culture and different tradition different food just the the newness of everything and obviously like within Europe it's not like it's wildly different but it's still different enough that you know you're somewhere new and you're kind of learning constantly you know the language barrier means that you're constantly learning working out like what you want from the supermarket all of that I love the challenge of it and that was kind of the thing I was saying to my husband when we were looking for this place in France is I was like I'm not expecting it to not have problems I know buying an old house in France is going to bring so many problems but they're going to be new problems they're going to be interesting kind of challenges and and problems to solve and that is the thing that has always excited me about travel is kind of the the discovery of it and the newness and the novelty and the adventure I mean things can go wrong can't they have you ever had any (laughs) negative experiences when you've on your trap on your travels Nothing too major, actually. No, I know some people have proper horror stories, but I'm trying to think now if we've had anything dramatic. Nothing really. Touch wood. <laughs> touch wood. Um, so I was imagining you touching wood and like the whole side of the house coming down. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've got to be careful which wood you touch in. Touch wood. 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I think it's been wrong. all right. Well, it depends what you class as wrong, isn't it? But we've never had any lost luggage. We've never had any major sicknesses while away or hospitalizations. We've never had any near misses or car accidents or any of those things that kind of spring to mind. And that's with traveling. You know, all has traveled with me since. Well, I was pregnant when I went to Venice and then she's traveled with me ever since. So I think we're pretty lucky that it's been fairly smooth sailing so far. Does that mean I'm due something awful to happen there? No, not at all. No, no <laughs> not everyone has to have disasters in life. And also you've got a chronic, chronic illness, you know, that's enough to contend to. I will, um, as the travel fairy, I will grant you uh, trouble-free you. travel for the rest of your life. Does it what stress- I will say... Go on, yeah. Um, is with the special assistance, and I'm sure anyone who's had to do this will know, you quite often do get forgotten. So you book it to collect you from the plane yeah they just don't they don't show up they don't and they won't let you off the plane because they're like no we're not allowed so then you're just stuck on the plane like I think the longest one has been like two and a half hours oh my god and the poor plane crew aren't allowed to leave because they can't leave you on the plane in case Mm. you steal it or something (laughs) um so yeah I would say that's probably the closest to a disaster I've got but I just think that that's it's really it's really dehumanizing to be forgotten and just left and you know, everyone else has gone off and they're carrying on with their holiday and you're still stuck on an empty plane waiting. But the, the staff are always so lovely and entertain all of them and give you Kit Kats. So. Oh, God, that would just be hideous because you've, it's bad enough. Sort of, It's like being delayed on the tarmac and you've got like two hours sitting there, you know, particularly with kids yeah. and the uncomfortable seats. And then you've got yeah. your journey to go, but you've just stuck there waiting to get off. That's just awful. Absolutely awful. Yeah, not good. Has it scratched the itch then with travel, uh, with, you know, buying the French house? Because, um, God, I'm about to say something that sounds awful right now and really privileged and really spoiled. And I'm like you, I grew up in a, you know, a family that didn't have that much money. In fact, our childhood holidays were down to the south of France, but only because my dad um, was a, a had car skills and he'd buy empty yeah. caravans and convert them into caravanettes. And then we'd sort of get a free holiday because he'd, you know, make a profit out of it. Um, so they, they were adventure, a bit like your grandparents, maybe they were adventurous, but without that much money. But um, I moved to live, I grew up in Spain and moved there when we were seven. We went down on the coach. That's how skint we were. We didn't even wow. fly. But um, it's all a bit of a roundabout way to saying seven years ago, my then husband and I bought a house in Spain. And it it kind of meant that we had this beautiful, lovely home in Spain, but it also meant that we went there every single holiday. So what I was about to say that makes you sound like a spoiled brat is it kind of (laughs) like, it's quite, it's a real bind having a holiday home. You know, you you kind of just go there and don't go anywhere else. It's really hard for us, isn't it? I hope people really sympathise with our our second home problems. Second home problems. (laughs) Somebody should write a book or do an Instagram account. Second Second home home problems. problems. Yeah, definitely. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, I left my favourite MAC lip liner at my other house. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. I remember this again sounds really awful. My husband and I, before we got married, we had a long time having a flat in London and a flat in Brighton. I owned one in London and he owned one here. And we'd find ourselves in the local supermarket going, have we got olive oil? Yeah, but have we got olive oil in the London flat? And you're like, oh, (laughs) God, you're such wankers. It's not (laughs) it's not even as it sounds, you know, we're not sort of like wealthy people. It's just second home nightmares, you know, second home problems was it. Second home, second home problems. I feel like, yeah, that's a. It could be a whole podcast. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Has, one has episode it, a week. Has it hit you yet that you're going to be going there for every holiday for Kingdom Come and not going? It anywhere hasn't. Else? Yeah, and, and that was of course because you justify buying the place with that, don't you? You're like, well, we'll save so much money because we won't go on holiday, so we'll just go there. And then you you kind of get here and you think, oh, okay. Uh, part of the reason I think it's not hit yet is because we had a really lovely villa in Greece booked pre-covid that got pushed back and pushed back and pushed back so we had to very unfortunately we had to go there earlier this year for 10 days on the beautiful greek oh, island that is left and then like i say it's only our second trip but what i think is gonna sustain me is there's a whole country to explore here right like there's all of france i can get to paris in a couple of hours on the train i can get down to like the proper south south of france you know where it's constantly tropical all year round so many villages and towns and cities that are within reach even if it's driving to Spain or you know driving to Italy those those things are all possible from here in a way that they're just not from the UK so I think it'll be a long while before I get the truly itchy feet a bit like how 
if you're in the UK, you can you can spend a good few years just getting to know the UK before you feel like you need to, to break out. I feel like we've got all of Europe kind of on our doorstep now. Yeah, lucky. You can just get in the car and drive. And I think yeah. that's something I've had plenty of people on this podcast that have like explored the, the world and sort of suddenly realized at the age of 18 that they can actually just get on their bike or start walking <laughs> yeah. and go around the world there's kind of nothing stopping you yeah. um, doing that over Brexit is a little bit annoying but, well um, my goodness yeah I could talk about that for a long yeah. time yeah that's another we'll we'll do that we'll file that along with our joint Instagram <laughs> account that we're going to start called second home problems second home problems <laughs> and also our disability round that, that we, we've managed to contain yes exactly yeah I mean I've got a current chronic condition I've got an underactive thyroid and yeah. I sometimes I, I, I think it's mainly in control it's not nearly as uh, debilitating as yours but sometimes I don't have to be a little bit you know kinder to myself thinking well actually you know you do have this and it's not always balanced and you know there are times when I'm going to be tired sometimes like right now like talking about you and your French house and being able to drive off to places in the sunshine I my body is I think it's aching for sun right now and it's not even yeah. proper winter Winter came very quickly this year in the UK, I think. Well, it's, it's not here in the south. It's actually beautiful and sunny. It's been oh, 18, good. 19 degrees here in late October, um, which is amazing. But it's still, I just need that that foreignness, that challenge, that, ex- that you know, the exploring, the yeah. wine, the food, you know, just to feel like I'm crying out for it. The good life. Well, come here. It's here. It's waiting. Hop yeah, on a plane. I will. Absolutely. I'd love to do something there. You know, we'll probably do some sort of work together at some point or podcasting. Yeah, something like that. Let's do something here. Absolutely. I feel like there's so much we could do here together. I just need to get some more beds and then you can come. Yeah, definitely. Okay. First bed there. I'm there. Um, I'm going to ask you my last question now. My last question is always about music and because I very much believe that music and travel for many people go hand in hand. Yeah. I'm going to ask you to think of you can take some time to think about it if you like one song that reminds you of a memorable time and place of travel what is the song and what is the memory oh that's a really good question there's probably a lot of them really good question (laughs) the first one that came to mind for me is a song called toast by tori amos it's Mm -hmm. just an album track i don't think it was even ever a single and um it came out around the time I first went to Barcelona and there was a line in it about maybe I'll see you in a cathedral in Barcelona. So me and my friend who were both fans spent the entire trip listening to that song and singing it to each other. Um, and they're, they're just very tied together in my memory. It's kind of a, a song about autumn. It's set in that kind of like last days of summer, kind of dry grasses and sunshine and uh, harvest and all of that kind of vibe and that was the time that we went there so it was just like the perfect soundtrack to that trip oh was that quite an early trip in your travel yeah that was in my kind of late tour. teens Pro- probably my first trip abroad with friends so like not with a family member well so my second trip abroad full stop yeah so um, the with the passport of three parents the first holiday was with the grandparents to Mallorca and then the second yeah. one to Barcelona a teenager Barcelona trip. with with friends I met on the internet all the way back then oh my god and I, was there even an internet <laughs> there was and we it, back then it was so shameful that you could not I couldn't tell anyone that we'd met online we used to have like a cover story for how we'd all met each other because oh, it sounded so- too funny much. really yeah, yeah. I've, I've, well, I've done lots of online dating now so that's a whole other that's a whole other podcast. oh yeah <laughs> but I do have women that I've met online like pre-social media that on the forums or whatever yeah. that you know we've become friends too which has been quite nice yeah and now it's really routine like me and you met online we met on Twitter and Instagram and that just seems really normal but, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I feel like you're my friend, even though we've never met. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> That's why I'm inviting you to my house. Yeah, exactly. I'll take you there. I'll turn up. I'll be there tomorrow with a suitcase, <laughs> soothed by aching bones. Um, I've also just thinking about Tori Amos. I've got to, we've got to wrap this up any second. But what, what is her obsession with breakfast? You know, because she had cornflake girl, didn't she? Which I have no <laughs> idea what that actually meant. And I still I'll, don't I can know. tell you. I can Honey, tell you. Is it if something like mucky? What is it? No, she did a, a jingle she appeared in a cornflake commercial when she was younger playing the piano and singing a song right and she never was a cornflake girl I see yeah. that she actually was a cornflake girl but she yeah, wasn't she really was. yeah she wasn't really yeah I got it yeah she's more of a toast girl 
Anyway, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on the Big Travel Podcast, and I will see you in France. See you very soon. Thank you so much, Sarah. I will absolutely come and see you in France. I really hope I can do that. Um, it sounds fantastic. And thank you so much for listening to the Big Travel Podcast. Please like and subscribe and give us a review and do all of that stuff because it really helps. Speak to you soon. Hello, I'm Helen from Flixwatcher. And I'm Kobe, also from Flixwatcher. The Netflix review podcast you go to when you can't find anything to watch on Netflix. That's right, we are another podcast in the strip media family. So if you've struggled to find a film on Netflix, then we're the podcast for you. And we have guests from other podcasts, big and small, and they're the ones that actually choose the films that we then rate and review and talk about in our show. If you'd like to find out more about Flixwatcher or any of the other shows, visit www.strip.media to find out more.